Good morning, everyone. I welcome all of you to this hearing about new patterns of persecution for defendants for human rights defenders in Cuba. It was requested by Movimiento San Isidro. The goal is so that organizations can give us information and at the same time that we can monitor the harassment situation, systematic obstruction and policies that are criminalizing the activism and work conducted by journalists and human rights defenders in Cuba denounces. My name is Antonio Rejola, the president uh, of the commission, and we have here with us the rapporteur for Cuba, the president of the commission, uh, Joel Hernandez, um, commissioner Margaret McCauley. She is the rapporteur for Afro-descendants for women. Uh, rapporteur Joel Hernandez is for human rights defenders. The secretary, the executive secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido, is here as well, and Pedro Vaca as well, and the rest of our team of the executive secretariat is here as well. So I welcome all of you to this hearing. And once again, unfortunately, in this public hearing, we only have representation of the civil society. We don't have representation of the state here. Therefore, we are going to give 40 minutes to the civil society so that they can make their presentation later Later on. The commission has 20 more minutes. We will see whether we can pose more questions or if there is any need for further time, we will see how it goes. Please, on your screens, when you start taking the floor, there is, um, you will see a box with the time you have left. So please pay attention to it. Anyway, when you are, uh, when, when there's only five minutes left, I'll try not to interrupt, but I will let you know. So please, as you start taking the floor, introduce yourself. It's very important for us to get to know who you are and so that you can tell us to what to which organizations you belong. So thank you. And now having introduce myself. I will give the floor to the civil society now and you can start. Okay, thank you, Madam President. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Juan Carlos Vargas. I'm the director of the Foundation for the Pan American democracy and promoter of Cuba Decide. In this period of session, the foundation and its related organizations, such as the UMPACU Union for Civil Rights Defendants, Impulso, Latinoamericana, and the Center for and defense that this, we express our concern for, I'm sorry, the speaker is breaking. Yeah. I apologize, the speaker is breaking. In 2020, there has been political crisis with a lot of repression and the pandemic has also had a great impact on us. In 2020, Cuba saw serious violations to human rights. Very frequently excused in the, because of the context of the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, the threats, the harassment, and the arbitrary detentions or continue being part of the government policy applied with the aim of neutralizing the work of independent journalists, activists, 
have taken a great boost and they, I'm sorry, he's breaking. Tensions increased after the sanitary dispositions that were announced, for example, uh, declaring a national alert because over 880, 784 victims were harassed by the surveilling services of the Ministry for the Interior as well, as well as other mechanisms of intimidation and at least 100 and fifty-seven people reported direct harassment within the same period or it's seven acts of repudiation by the security forces to intimidate journalists and activists. This center registered, uh, registered attacks against whole families. For example, the case of the family Miranda Leiva that uh, led to a precautionary measure extended for all of its members, but the state has ignored it. This day, the, this center also registered at least 78 cases of torture or degrading actions that uh, affected the victims physically. And this occurred during arrests or even on the streets. For example, a police officer hurt a man on the streets and uh, shattered four of his teeth. Amongst these patterns, we find one that specifically affects the quality of life of the citizenship intentionally by the state, which is the abstraction of humanitarian work by the civil society and the as brought. Now, several organizations, groups, and movements have been victims of persecution since the beginning of the pandemic. Amongst them, we find the members of the San Isidro movement independent journalists and other activists who were, had to um, stay within our offices. Also the Damas de Blancos, Blanco and also the members of Unión Patriotica de Cuba. And we have at least found 28 incidents related to the four of the persecution patterns to human rights defendants in Cuba. My name is Caterina Hernandez. I'm an activist and a promoter of Cuba Despide. In consequence, after this year of monitoring, we have determined that these four are the repre most recurring repressives in the island. First one, using reclusion and isolation and detentions on political reasons under the uh, justification of uh, subversive activities. They arrest the victims and send them to aid or hospitals, aid centers or hospitals under the excuse of uh, submitting them, uh, subjecting them to uh, medical uh, examinations. But once they try to reach an attorney, for example, they refuse to give them any information. And after two and 14 or 14 hours, the victims are removed clandestinely from that place and are sent to um, police headquarters or are released finally. But there are no actual records of the uh, violence in these activities. We have um, statements from the victims. The police and the repressive core 
use the pre-existing regulations and the new ones within the framework of the pandemic to beat to uh, convict human rights advocates and independent citizens to limit their freedom of expression. That was the case of Kelimida Lamoraimayes. We will see her testimony now. I'm sorry, Margaret, but uh, the video appears to be muted, so no one is hearing this. Okay, so I was... Okay, the video cut was interrupted. I apologize, Margaret. Um, yeah, the video... I'm sorry, let me try to share my screen again. The reason why I'm doing this video is for all of you to know what I suffered because of being an activist and a, a defender of human rights. I was arrested in the street. I was smoking a cigarette. They arrested me. They took me to a police unit. They accused me of lack of obedience. This was a year and a half ago when I, I entered prison on June the 4th. And the police was uh, saying, The video is really breaking, I, the, the sound is breaking. When I was in prison, I really apologize for the sound. So I didn't get enough medical assistance. They didn't. The treatment that I had to do, I never received them. I was for 13 days there in a cell. I apologize, Margaret, it's breaking a lot. You know, the edge disappeared. I we apologize again.
Okay, upon the request of the Center of Denouncies, we issued a precautionary measure. We couldn't and is there any way in which they can organize that? Okay. There were fines for journalists and citizens because they documented the abuses by the state. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Is it okay or is it breaking? Can you hear me? Yes, Catherine, now you're back. Yes, but it's the, the sound is breaking a lot, Antonia says. No, now we, we've lost you again. Shall I continue? The point is that your voice is coming and going. Abuse of the regulations associ associated to COVID-19 to, to apply fines to citizens, journalists, because as, as they documented and denounced the abuses committed by the state broke again. But, I'm sorry, I'm, she said telecommunication and then it broke again. The telecommunication services are usually used as mechanism for social control with the aim of broken. So as not to allow information to flow freely and to obstaculize the, to hinder internal communication, no excuse that might, even if it's solidarity action might be obstacled. There are fines of up to 3000 pesos posed to independent journalists that are broadcasting information with in the context of the pandemic, there are arbitrary detentions. We will leave Jan Hernandez, a journalist. tanto por the pandemic that we are experiencing in Cuba because of the a law there are fines and even imprisonment for Cubans because of because they say that they propagate the pandemic. There are up to 2,000 Cuban pesos hindered movements to different places and for a certain amount of time. In Cuba, there are places where you cannot just go in or out.
in different from whole province the sound of Kine. from life in the morning in how move in, a, in the morning so those are part of the mesh taken by the regime and they also used the justification of the pandemic to take officials dressed as doctors and take us out of our center. The journalists and activists have been the victims because they've restricted our service, our internet service, during during some weeks we were not able to have access to internet there were arbitrary arrests i apologize it's breaking a lot again on march the 8th i was one of the people who was under siege in several locations. There has been a lot of repression of this regime, such as arbitrary detentions. Staying under siege. And also to my family members and relatives, because they because of thinking differently, December the 9th, I suffered from a repudiation act that day. There was no condemnation to any of the people that were doing this repudiation to me. Nobody received any fines because it was an activity led by the Cuban regime. cientos de incidentes en que los ciudadanos son obligados a testimony have turned into a crime the el estado ha connection or an internet connection and this is done especially against independent journalists uh, or people who need to seek help 
I'm sorry, someone else has their mic on and it's impossible to hear to the person speaking. Hello, what's happening? Hello? Hello? I don't know if it's wrong. It's also they have state violates that to um of circulation. State has legislated hundreds of acts in the Communist Party where hundreds of people The state has instigated hundreds of acts of repudiation. Hi, Margaret, can you hear me? Margaret, can you hear me? Hi, Margaret, can you hear me? One, two, three.
Hello, I'm not hearing or seeing anything. vida de que era la fiebre y era de, estábamos desesperados porque ellos ahí ahí hello hello i'm not hearing anything. hi margaret can you hear me now no, hello margaret yes, yes? Mm -hmm. great Okay, we, we had several problems with the connection. I will start interpreting now. Okay. So, my mother cannot get her stuff because I'm afraid they will take her and I don't know what's going to happen because they want to capture me and Adrian. But if they take my mom or one of my family members, I don't know what's gonna happen to them. So we're locked in and we cannot do anything. We will send the testimonies so you can better see them. But of what little you could see, they, it shows that these actions are actions of state terrorism, the same acts of state terrorism, all Cubans are submitted every day. Now we will see the testimony of Michael Castillo. Good morning, my name is Michael Costillo. I'm one of the 15 people who are uh, here. They, on November 26, 2020, we were uh, taken from here. Some of us were on a hunger strike and were very weak. Days, a few days before, we had went to the police station and read poetry. After that, we were arrested. And they, that's, and they use excuses to prosecute people who think differently. They prosecute Cubans who, act, who um, think differently and they prosecute them by surveilling them, by um, exerting pressure on them, sometimes with violence. They put me in handcuffs. I was beaten up in front of the police station in Havana by about 10 police officers. That night, uh, none of these detentions are uh, done with legal orders and the police violate sanitary measures all the time. They feel above the law and above morality. They also carry out acts of repudiation and are aggressive to people in the neighborhoods. They have uh, thrown acids at us and this violence affects all Cubans. And in the last couple of weeks, they have even violated the privacy of houses, even with children inside. In my house, for example, in my house, I sue my lips and went to the police office, uh, to the police station to denounce police violence. 
in Cuba, there are over 130 political detainees. Some of them are suffering COVID and we don't know how they are because they are not allowed to use the phone. Prisons in Cuba are full of inmates with COVID and the state has been unable to control the situation. Inmates in Cuba are dying of COVID in prisons. Finally, I would like to tell you about an aggression against a group of artists in January 2021. justification for repression and also economic repression because there are very expensive fines for those who disobey the measures. Many members of the movements have precautionary measures who were that were issued by you and they are not respected. They continue to violate our rights they continue to uh, carry out acts of aggression against our families and our citizens and the repression goes on and on. Sorry, the sound is breaking up. We are artists and we are fighting for our rights. We, the last part was impossible. Michael Castillo was speaking here. He was talking about the serious situation in Cuban prisons. My name is Rosa Maria Paya. I'm uh, the executive director uh, of and promoter of Cuba Decides, Cuba Decide, and can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. What we would like to present is the arbitrary seizure of the humanitarian aid sent by uh, civil society organizations and independent citizens. The state uses arbitrary methods and even illegal methods to prevent the citizens from accessing uh, money or uh, medicine or food. The state seized almost 45 tons of food sent by uh, Cuban institutions in the United States and other countries. The Cuban state violated the right of Cubans abroad to relate a religion of the churches because they didn't allow them to help others to help the 15 vulnerable families who had registered from the island to request the aid. Many of them continue to uh, to protest by pacific means. We will listen to one of the, their testimonies. I'm here talking to you because I was notified that I would receive aid from people exiled, workers and non-workers. They got together because they know of our situation here in Cuba with COVID-19. And they decided to send a care package and they sent it. 
and I need to know why that aid is not getting here. There are people who need it, like me and people who are worse off than me. My brother is blind, he cannot see. My granddaughter is three and she doesn't speak, she doesn't walk, she has disabilities. How can I feed them? As you can see, this is the situation we're living in because here they said that they are helping, they are sending hell aid to mothers. But what is that? Because aid would be their bringing to me what I was sent. They only said they took the aid and sold it. They sold 12 kilos of chicken, 500 pesos. I had to ask my friends for money for a loan. So I demand for them to let that aid in because those people gave us whatever they could find and now we cannot receive it. They know what we're going through in Cuba. There's no food here, there is nothing. So amid this terrible situation, the state uses its resources to defend the human rights, to persecute the defenders and to not enable them to help those in greater need, hindering the work of churches and civil society is systematically is something that systematically happens. This is not new, but it has become different because it creates a policy of state in order to exert full control and also has tragic consequences amidst the sanitary, the health crisis. Our headquarters in at this right time is being oppressed by the agents. They arrested and they hit a lot of minors in the last few years so that they would not be able to reach the food that was given to them. Let's listen to their testimonies. My name is Manuel Ferrar Garcia, the coordinator of Union Patriotica de Cuba, ONPACU, and of the Campaña Ciudadana. For the last few months, they've kept repression, harassment, and it has actually increased. All of that has increased against members of our organization and promoters of Cuba Decide, Cuba Decides. Since mid July 2020 till mid January 2021, the regime kept uh, surrounding our headquarters in Altamira, the province of Santiago de Cuba. In that time, there was more than 120 arbitrary arrests, several of which were violent. They applied fines to activists. They had violated the security perimeter imposed. I'm sorry, the sound, we completely lost the sound. Apologize, Margaret, there's no sound at all. So that my wife and myself conducted 
in protest for the continuous attacks and for the arbitrary arrests and violent arrests as well, and for the illegal occupation and seizure of medicine and food. We also experienced several arbitrary arrests, many of which were violent, with physical aggression, experienced or made by police members. And they were using the pandemic of COVID-19 in, in order to continue arbitrarily arresting our activists, our colleagues, to harass them, to incarcerate some of them. Several activists are currently in prison because according to the to the political police. Oh, it's breaking again. The time of COVID-19, but those accusations were false, were fake. Violent arrests and even aggressions such as throwing different products to our headquarters products that had very strong and horrible smells are part of the actions that the repressive forces are conducting against us and our activists. Thank you. Okay, so you've listened to the testimony. I don't know if you were able to see him. I think it hasn't worked, but as soon as this broadcast is over, we um, will send you the video. I'm not sure if you can listen, if you can hear me. Yes, Prosta, we can hear you. Okay. So in order to conclude, and I really apologize, I'm sorry for all the connection problems. It's actually a PhD, but I would like to summarize maybe that amid the pandemic of COVID-19 and in I mean, the crisis that our current current countries experiencing, we've identified four patterns. First, detentions, political detentions with violations, uh, using the pandemic as an excuse, and using hospitals as places for reclusion. Second, things related to COVID-19 and re giving, giving excuses in order to denounce the manipulation of the media, harassment to political harassment to political activists and to human rights defenders and the possible help that we might receive right now at a time when the pandemic pandemic reaches an unprecedented number of deaths, we show our concern for the systematic application of these violations of human rights and because of their consequences that are even greater amid the humanitarian crisis that we have in Cuba. It is evident that as the protests increase in our country and the mobilizations increase for a democratic change, there is also an increase in the terror acts of the state against the citizens. However, using force and violence against specific groups in order to show, to send fear to the rest of the population is the definition of terrorism. She's breaking a lot again. We, I'm sorry, I cannot follow her. The, that the right? I'm sorry, I'm listening to, I'm just hearing parts of her words. Five, that the representatives of the Cuban state do not have legitimacy and they are not prepared to defend human dignity. Therefore,
I apologize again, Margaret. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me okay. Antonia says we were having a lot of connection problems. It was very difficult. But first of all, I would like to ask you, as we were having so many uh, connection problems, it, it will be essential for the Commission if you can actually send us the videos that you tried to present, uh, all the testimonies, so as to be able to listen to them. We were not really able to to understand and so as to be better able to monitor everything that you wanted to show to us today. So we will be waiting for that. Please do send us all the videos and information. I will therefore give the floor to the reporter of your country first, Commissioner Eduardo Rallon, in case he has any comments to make. So reporter, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good morning, everyone. To all my colleagues of the Commission, I would also like to welcome everyone coming from the civil society in Cuba. We've had in this hearing very serious connection problems. However, we tried to listen to your key main ideas of a dramatic situation of human rights that is currently happening on the island. We've taken down note of what you said, the systematic patterns that you describe, which as it was required, I think it would be really important to receive the audio and the videos because we were not able to listen to them clearly or maybe uh, fully, as well as some figures because you were trying to mention some uh, hard, hard data or figures and a certain uh, like date and time, the amount of victims that go that go against human rights. So please do send us all of that. On the island, we are still conducting monitoring activities. Last year, we presented the report on the situation of human rights on the island. And one of the goals there was to focus, to give, um, let's say, a technical approach that might create a basis or a foundation for each of the actions that we might conduct uh, or that you make these violations of human rights more visible following following on uh, on everything that movimiento san isidro has done we provided at least precautionary measures to at least 20 of its members and within that context we've been able to talk to the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, Pedro Vaca, about the very serious phenomenon of censorship in terms of not being free to show your thoughts, to express yourselves. There are, there's a group of artists, journalists, human rights defenders who have suffered some of the patterns that you were describing but mainly they are not allowed to show or to express their ideas freely if it's an, a different idea by means of censorship methods such as manipulation or obstruction to access to the social media to the use of the internet so using the tools that the commission has available after receiving or after making all the monitoring that we usually conduct, we will analyze according to the requests and according to our actions for the promotion of human rights, we will recommend some action and we will recommend and we will make a statement. Um, this will be just my final comments. We will continue paying attention to keeping a fluid communication with you, such as we've had so far. We are willing to any kind of requests that you may have 
because the, um, there are usually a lot of requests for precautionary measure and so as to be able to react rapidly and to make the situation visible. We know that it is a bit difficult situation because of the position that the state took many years ago, but that doesn't make us work less, any less uh, rapidly and with the, what we need to do in order to address your requests, your needs. So we, uh, we are committed to supporting you in a change that we hope to see in the area, in the sphere of human rights on the island. That's just what I wanted to, to comment. Madam President, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rallon. Now I'd like to give the floor to Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much for reaching out to the Commission once again for requesting this hearing to bring our attention to these patterns of prosecution to human rights women human rights advocates in Cuba, which has been uh, the the topic of your of the testimonies you have shown. You have our full support in your work in such a, a context, in such a complex context to fight for human the human right to defend rights, which is what this group of human rights advocates is doing. I would like to begin by something basic. The pandemic has affected everyone, the entire world, and there are restriction measures everywhere around the world measures that restrict the right to mobility, to work, to freedom of association. But from the first moment, from the beginning, the commission established that these restrictions of rights need to be done in accordance with standards that need to be respected in every democratic society they need to be legal, they need to be necessary, they need to be proportional, and uh, they need to be done only when necessary. And when these measures exceed these parameters, we often see arbitrary situations, the abuse of rights, and the use of the pandemic as a pretext to intimidate and silence human rights advocates. And that is what makes it so concerning because the pandemic can only be fought with a civil society, with an active civil society in dialogue with the authorities so that they can implement adequate measures to protect the health of the people. So I would like to thank you for your trust in the Commission for bringing uh, these situations to our attention. Of course, we find we are very concerned about the fact that the precautionary measures issued by the Commission, like Resolution 14 2021, which was issued for over 20 people of the San Isidro group are not being respected. The truth is um, this comes as no surprise. We all know about the lack of participation of the Cuban state in the work of the OAS and of the Commission. It's a situation we regret because the Commission and because by having a closer dialogue, a tighter dialogue with the state, that's better. But this silence by the state 
in the framework of these precautionary measures is decision not to present information about the compliance or basically uh, and observing it as you are showing this is something really regrettable commissioner Rallon was saying this on his exposition the commission has a mandate and that is our commitment the commission has historically understood it has jurisdiction over the 35 states of the OAS, including Cuba, and will continue to uh, carry out its mandate whenever there's a lack of compliance with precautionary measures. It is a thorough procedure based on the principle of contradiction, but it is an instrument recognized by international law in human rights to protect the life and the integrity of persons. So as long as the requirements are met, the commission will continue to act in its function, in its duty to protect. As I think that we will continue to um, monitor the situation in Cuba, as Commissioner Rallon said, but also it is important to present the report that denounce one of our duties as a commission is to raise awareness throughout the continent about the human rights situation. And this is done through the visibilization of situations and through denounce. So the dinos. So, as long as the commission has the objective information through its sources, like one of you, one of these sources is you, the commission has a conventional obligation to shed light on the situation, to raise awareness in the situation. We, as, as I said, we appreciate and we will continue to observe the rights of human rights in, in Cuba. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Commissioner Margaret, would you like to say something? Yes, yes, thank you, Ms. Um, Madam President. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you to the San Isidro movement for bringing um, more up, uh, up to date information about the situation and human rights violations. Um, I thank you very much. I had in my last meeting with Afro Cubans, um, um, with the assistant of Race and Equality Institute, I had heard some of these um, um, matters and conduct of security forces and so on in relation to the Afro-descendants, uh, human rights defenders. And um, and of course, I was aware that all um, human rights defenders in Cuba were suffering the use of detention, arrest and detention and molestation on the street by security forces and uh, detention being at for some of them for one day only, some of them several days, some of them weeks, and some of them having be, being accused of false uh, um, acts of crime uh, um, in order to intimidate and try to, to sh shut their mouths up and their, their actions and their protests against uh, these violations. And as, as um, my brother commissioners have stated already, it is uh, very pitiful that our precautionary measures are not having, and the press releases are not having any um, effect. And indeed, our annual report are not having any visible effect on the um, state uh, uh, and the executive of Cuba. Um, but I, we need to hear what is happening all the time in order to put on the record 
in the regional uh, um, arena um, what is happening to the citizens of Cuba. So uh, the videos, which unfortunately uh, we couldn't hear properly, and I hope that I will have an opportunity of having somebody assist me to translate them when you send them later to us. But I, I do thank you and I hope you will continue to provide us with information um, periodically um, as, as things progress to um, not to detain people during the pandemic and not provide for them a sanitary uh, uh, environment and to provide health services. So please let us know whatever information you have when you have them. Thank you very much. And may you be protected. It is a good thing that they, they do know, they may take no, no, pay no attention, active attention, but to know that they are in our sites, I think is helpful. And I hope you agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McCauley. I will give the floor now to the Rapporteur for Freedom of, of Expression. Thank you so much, Madam President. And thank you to the authorities who are here and the um, and everyone here. First of all, I would like to thank you because this commission receives constant information from different sources and countries of the region, but this rapporteurship is very much aware of the additional difficulties on the uh, Cuban civil society to gather this information, to register and to send it to us. So I agree with the president, these technical issues um, should not be an obstacle for us to receive the videos so that they can be part of the documentation. I hope we can receive them because there are additional difficulties, of course, and interruptions in internet connections that need to be monitored as well. The second comment I'd like to share is there's a sort of normalization of certain restrictions on freedom of expression and because we have diagnosed this for a while now at my rapporteurship. We know about the difficult situations in because there are always obstacles in Cuba, especially for dissident voices, but something that, that has been changing in this last period is that we started to see some sort of exhaustion because something because something that is not normal is now being seen as normal no one should suffer a sort of vengeance because of their opinions or their public interest to remember that the rapporteurship for freedom of expression issued a report on freedom of expression in cuba and there are a couple of conclusions that are very important right now. It's the only country throughout the region where there is no kind of warranty for freedom of expression. And this is very concerning. And this also occurs within an environment of a state where the state owns all the communication medias and which is becoming more complex because of new technologies and access to the internet and we have identified repressive practices against those who uh, our rapporteurship has insisted on the need to reconsider normative frameworks the protection of free press and for many 
measures to be implemented to stop the criminalization of persons because of their opinions uh, about uh, the public officials. we will we know about all of the requests you presented we can we are constantly monitoring the situation and we hope to continue to fulfill our mandate in this complex field and in this complex uh, context for the exertion of freedom of expression thank you very much Thank you. Now I will listen to the acting executive secretary, Ms. Pulido. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank you again for this. Because uh, we know about the situation of human rights advocates, young human rights advocates in Cuba as well uh, reports and about the situation of human rights advocates in the island but I would like hi Margaret uh, there are um, there are several delays in the interpreting in receiving the audio it's a several seconds or at least a minute before I say it. En este país. I think I have, I don't have a con good connection, Madam President. I think there's a problem with the internet. Okay. Apparently, there is a, a delay. So. Commission issued four recommendations. One of them is abstaining to depriving, arbitrarily depriving the freedom of human rights advocates. Just like to say that uh, apart from the report of the year 2020, 
right now the commission has approved a new country report Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the country report included Cuba on Article 4B for 2020. And this will be Thank you, Maria Claudia. I hope you can all hear me that from the technology team. They tell me that, um, okay, in the room, I think it's here in the room, hear me, um, mainly the petitioners, the petitioner parties. Okay, I would just like to insist on the fact that we really need to receive all the testimonies that you tried to present today so that we can review all of them. And the report that our reports did not have any impact on the state. I usually believe that regardless of the responses of the state, the ideal thing, of course, would be that there is um, a dialogue with information exchange with the state as well. That would be the most logical and essential thing. But when that doesn't happen, and I still believe it is important that organisms such as the Commission may continue holding this kind of hearings, issuing press releases, precautionary measures, and asking for information to the state, even if they don't respond, because it is still another way to continue applying pressure and to make these questions of human rights visible in those countries with, in this case, with an obstacle to information as the case of Cuba. So I think it is still always to get a proper dialogue with the state. I will now give the floor to the civil society representatives again. We still have 10 minutes for this hearing and you will have, uh, well, whichever time you need out of these 10 minutes to make final comments, remarks, or to make the closure. I'm not sure if there's anyone speaking or not. I cannot hear anyone, Antonia says. Um, this is no, when talking to the state because we cannot maybe make a, a sign with your hand or with the cameras. I cannot hear anything, Antonia says. Thank you, Madam President, Interim Secretary as well, I would like to wrap up by thanking all the rest of the organizations that are part. Okay, her audio. 
we, we lost her. And presidents, can you hear anything? No, unfortunately, um, Rosa Maria, I'm not sure if you're still there or not. We are having serious problems with the platform. The um, uh, secretary and Cosa, now there are two overlapping voices. The point is that from a certain time to a certain time, I think it is a problem within the platform because from time to time there is no sound whatsoever and then all voices overlap, Antonia says. It's very puzzling. I mean, what's happening with the connection is very puzzling, Rosa Maria says. Are we back? Can you hear me? No, unfortunately, I mean, there, there was always some kind of connection problem, but I think this has never happened before. I cannot hear anyone. Rosa's voice is overlapping, saying, I cannot hear anyone. Madam President. Some. I don't know if. Anyone can hear me? Antonia says, this is actually the first time that something so serious happens within the platform. This is, uh, well, part of what the pandemic left us. Mm, uh, we are struggling with the platform. Some people who are listening to us from outside the platform, they tell us that they can hear us better than those who are here. So we are going to finish the hearing now. It is really very difficult to hold a conversation like this. We are going to try and see the problem. First of all, people who are listening to the hearing from the outside, they say it's better. We cannot hear one another. All those who are here in, on the Zoom platform, it's becoming very difficult to hold a dialogue. I really apologize for this. We are going to check to see what happens. This is the very first time that something this serious is happening. We, we've conducted a lot of virtual hearings so far, but I would just like to um, ambition that you tried to share with us today. I'm sure that we will pay attention to this. And if you want to have a working session or a working meeting, a private one afterwards, I'm sure that the rapporteur Ralon and the rest of the commission will be available and at your disposal for that. But I think that if we continue insisting on this platform with all the serious trouble that we are currently having, I think it doesn't make any sense. We have an, another hearing in half an hour, we'll see what happens with the platform. Or if it was just a question of, well, the connection with you in this hearing. I'm, I'm really sorry, I apologize again. The, the important thing and the positive thing is that at least we could take down note of the situation that you were trying to uh, communicate to us. We will continue being in touch. 
I hope that at least you were able to listen to these final uh, words, at least make a signal with your hands or with, okay, yes, yes, I think, uh, thumbs up. Okay, so we will wrap up this hearing now. It's, uh, I mean, technology, that's the way it is. It's, um, it's um, truly a pity. Sometimes there are connection problems for one participant or another, but this is quite more complex. I apologize again. Thank you all, all of you. And we will be looking forward to the next meeting. Maybe if it's not a hearing, but at least it will be an internal meeting to continue uh, addressing this topic. Thank you and big hug to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for all the information.